safe. The only reason that we have guns here is for our own personal protection and safety. Right now, the threat level isn't as high or intense, so we don't walk around full kit, uh, you know, slung weapons everywhere. There, there may be a few individuals like that, but one of our number one orders to all the men and women here, never, ever, ever fire unless fired upon. And we will stand our ground with that. We are calling out at this time because of intel that we have received from a solid source that the FBI is indeed planning on uh, moving on us, if you will. I had put out a request for assistance from the Oregon State Sheriff's Association. And since it was a federal wildlife refuge and had been taken, I, I requested that the uh, FBI handle that investigation. We are preparing to defend ourselves, preparing to defend the people of Harney County, and we are preparing to expose this corruption that has been going on for years, and it needs to end here. Thank you. When I grew up, I never got out alive. I never spoke out of turn. You know, I was one of those kids when I, when I walked from in class in Sunday school when I was a little kid, all the other kids were rowdy, and I, I always folded my arms and trying to get, it came naturally to, to be in line. Um, and so this is very out of character for me because I've always tried to follow the rules. And, and to get, do you know I don't have a speeding ticket today? I, I do have one warning. This choice is solely mine. Nobody asked me to do this. Uh, Bundy's didn't ask me to do this. Um, they didn't. They didn't stop me. They respected my choice. But this this choice, this decision is is mine and mine alone. And I will live with it. And I'll bear the consequences, whatever they may be. I was stunned at the escalation of FBI presence. They had turned the county courthouse into a fortress. They had ringed it with chain link cyclone fencing. They had put in Jersey barriers for like ramming. Those guys were kitted up for warfare with more kit that I had seen in Afghanistan. The amount of escalation and force that they were willing to use for a handful of protesters was very um, shocking. We were 35 miles away from the town. Nobody ever threatened anybody. I don't understand where the level of fear came from. They shut the BLM down. They shut the Forest Service down. They shut the schools down. There wasn't a gun at the refuge that would shoot 30 miles. We in this land we grow up clinking tin cans with 22s, hunting jackrabbits, and the first thing we're taught is what? Do not point guns at people. And so I have never in my life pointed a gun at a person, and I never intend to. You know, they should never point a gun at me, and I shall not point a gun back, and, and we shall leave it at that. But, but I will live under a clear sky till the day I die. Worst case scenario, they come down and kill us all. I don't think they want to do that because they still lose. The American people across from ocean to ocean will retaliate and uh, their power will be taken away from them. We know that what we're doing is right. We know that this is constitutional and we know that we're trying to improve this country. I know what our government can do and I didn't want these people to get hurt. I'm just out here to keep people safe, make sure there's no shots going off. If the FBI did come, they would come dark with night vision. They've got helicopters, MRAPs, all that fancy technology. They've got unlimited resources, and we're just a bunch of <laughs> we're just a bunch of guys out here with rifles that we bought a couple of years ago. There's some guys out here with rifles from World War II. They're ready too. They've only got five shots, but. They're ready. I, I have a feeling if the FBI did come here that uh, nobody would be leaving alive. With the escalation of FBI presence, it became very concerning that they were going to try and go after these guys violently. There was a discussion as what do we do? And so the decision was made that PPN would take a neutral position. We would not endorse support or other, but it became Ammon 
you guys stay on the refuge. Government, FBI guys, you stay on your side of the line. Keep the separation here. You two have issues you want to discuss and work out. You, your civil disobedience, drawing attention to land use. They can do that. Keep your distance. We have every constitutional right to be doing what we're doing because it very clearly states in the Constitution that <clears throat> the federal government does not have the right, does not have the authority of the, from the people to come down into the states and to control its land and resources. If they are to, if they are to control land and resources in the state, then it has to be properly ceded to the federal government. And the way that's done is outlined in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. Under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, Congress will have authority with the consent of the legislature over forts, arsenals, dockyards, magazines, and other needful buildings. That's all they can have as far as places in the state of Oregon. This whole reserve here is unconstitutional and the states have to, well, of course, right now the militias are stepping up to take this land back from the federal government and giving it to the states. There is a federal central power called the federal government that says that they own and control one third of the land mass of this country. Now, they have complete legislative power. A man just sitting behind the desk can write a statute that has the force and effect of law. If I or the rancher gets contrary with that, there is a ranger, a BLM ranger, that is armed with a gun that enforces that statute. If you get contrary more, you're hauled before a federal court. Now, neither the bureaucrat is elected nor accountable to me, and the ranger is not elected nor accountable to us, the people, and the judges aren't. All three branches of power are combined into one without representation. So this is a serious issue to freedom. Everything that we live in, the cars we drive, the clothes we wear, everything comes from the earth. When those resources are restricted or controlled to the point where people can't access them, they can't use them, they can't benefit from them, then what it does is it puts people into poverty. A perfect example of that is Harney County. At one time, Harney County was the wealthiest county in the state, and now it's the poorest county in the state. And it is directly connected with the federal government coming in and controlling its land and resources. Well, these are the best of times to come on down to Hines. In the 20s, Edward Hines Lumber Company had a 50-year contract for cutting timber here. This town was amazingly wealthy. The mill was operating lots of lumber. We were number one in the state for per capita income for at least one year in the 70s. Tonight, we look at a battle that's raging in the United States over an endangered bird. The northern spotted owl is said to be on the verge of extinction. Logging in the Pacific Northwest has almost eradicated its habitat. Biologists believe this bird must have the large trees of the ancient forest to survive. There are only 3,000 pairs left, and they say if it goes, it means the entire ecosystem and all who live in it are at risk. The environmental industry got their act together put the focus on the spotted owl and undermine the timber economy within six months. We lost a thousand jobs in this town in a county that had around 8,000 population. It was absolutely devastating. We're in a tower. Uh, these towers are actually used to detect fires from long distances and we use it for observation um, in case the feds decide to roll in here and kill us. It was, it was kind of scary for the first couple of days because uh, we thought that, as we've seen throughout history, Ruby Ridge and Waco, um, Ruby Ridge, I mean, the FBI and ATF came in and they shot a pregnant lady, uh, a pregnant woman who was unarmed. So they've been known to come in and kill people. It originally started off with the Hammonds, but I've been fighting the BLM for years now. I was at the Bundy Ranch standoff. The BLM's original role were land janitors. Now they're armed with SWAT teams and attack helicopters and weapons of war. Uh, why would they need that? They're just supposed to be land janitors. And it, it, they should not constitutionally exist. The goal of this occupation is one, to get clemency for the Hammonds. We'd like them out of prison. And also we'd like to see the control of these lands go back to their rightful owners and this give back 
into the hands of uh, the people of Harney County. Uh, they are oppressed in the highest order. They're so afraid to speak out because if they speak out, they're afraid that the BLM and other entities are going to steal their uh, grazing permits and everything else, which is actually a grazing right. We have a situation in this county where the Bureau of Land Management, the Fish and Wildlife Service, have teamed up and taken hundreds of thousands of acres away from the people. It has brought wealth and power to these government officials and put the people in duress and put them in poverty. It is acts like this that expose the true problem. So this argument evolved into, we're going to take this and we're going to give it back to the ranchers. You, you can't set the precedent that it's okay to just go take something over and say, we're going to decide who this goes to. The Constitution of the United States does not allow the federal government to own land. This land will go back to the people of Harney County, and they will be able to use the land and resources for their benefit. There are a lot of people who will tell you the federal government can only own small things like forts and docks and all kinds of military things. The Constitution does say that. It's talking about a part of the Constitution that was making provision for a new capital for the United States. And the provision was that they could pay whatever states they took the land from, no more than 10 square miles, and that they would make provisions for the docks and the magazines for uh, ammunition and other military forts. But that was to defend the nation's capital which had not yet been established, and that was just something in the Constitution to make provision that it could be created. They were just talking about what's now Washington, D.C. That's it. Yeah, the donations are coming from all over the United States. A lot of them have come straight from the ranchers that live in the town. They appreciate everything we're doing, and it makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm doing something for a good cause. I'm a terrorist. Obviously, we are all terrorists here. And anybody that comes on this property is a terrorist. And the media coming in here, I don't really want to talk to them anymore because they're going out and telling everybody that we're not doing the right thing. And we are doing the right thing. You know, we all have families. We have children. We have jobs. We stepped away from that life to come over here and, and do some good for our community. These people deserve better than this. Our government should know better than this. They don't, they have, they don't they have no feelings, no no compassion for anybody in this country at all anymore. They're not representing us whatsoever. My reason for being out here with a throat broke the camel's back was the fact that uh, the media trying to make it, make it play out that, that uh, the Hammonds were, you know, are some kind of domestic terrorist. I mean, this is a 74-year-old man. He knows he goes to prison for another four years. He ain't coming back out to see his family again. Over a, a, a 139 acres that burn up. Us patriots go through such bullshit. The American public has no idea. We're pro-Constitution. The Constitution of the United States. We are pro-government. We're not anti-government. We are against people that are in power, that abuse their power in government, that do not follow the Constitution. It doesn't matter how many there are that are for us or how many there are against us, even if there's just one person that's being terrorized or, or forced to live in oppression, then we need to step in and we need to help lift them up and build them up. It's one of our founding father quotes that says, uh, it does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority, keen on setting the brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. And that's, that's where we're facing right now. What they did as a protest to occupy a place where they had no right to be, it was an attempt to protect liberty the way they saw it. The way they saw it happened to be not according to the law and not even according to history. The only solution if you don't like the law is to change the law. You have two choices. One of them is through the democratic process and the other one is through revolution. When you've got an army bigger and better than the United States, let me know. Federal government, go home. Take care of federal things. 
secure our borders, protect our nations, keep commerce regular, and just a couple other things. Get get the heck out of Dodge and, and leave the rest for the state and the counties to take care of. Let the people be free. It's high time, Dad Gummit. Get out of town. You cannot go to war against the federal government. This is not 240 years ago. There is no group of armed militiamen that can go up against the awesome power of the federal government. It ain't going to happen. Best case scenario is that the people of the county stand and take claim of their own rights, meaning they stop paying the federal government to manage their rights. They stop entering into contracts that take their constitutional rights away. Once that is done and, and recognized, we want to see the Hammonds freed. Dwight Hammonds, same age as my father. My father is pretty healthy still. He can saddle up his horse and ride with me. He helps me when I need some help. You know how many more years when you're 75 are you going to be able to continue to get out there and chase those cows at a full run? You know, I'm so grateful for those few years that I still have with my father. Where's Dwight? Where's Dwight Hammond? Where is he spending those five years, Dad? If we don't get him out of prison, that's why I am sitting here on this place, call me an occupier, call me a terrorist, call me a dadgum ignorant redneck. I don't care. I am here for Dwight Hammond and his family, and they had better get out of that prison. They need to be pardoned. Mr. Obama, you and I don't see eye to eye on probably anything, but I am appealing to your humanity, Mr. President Obama, to pardon them. It is unjust. Let them go home to their families. Let them go home to the families. I want to get the heck out of Dodge. I want to go back home to Arizona. I don't want to be here on this place, but I am here because of the actions of this federal government. And by dang, if you want to, if you want to, you want to give me a warrant to come after me with the FBI, so be it. I don't care, but you better well let those, those Hammond families out of prison because things are starting to heat up and, and I don't think you guys actually even really care. There was no communication. Ammon wasn't talking to the county. The county wasn't talking to Ammon. And so that became a concern is you're sitting on the refuge, you're sitting in the courthouse and the FBI sitting in the schoolhouse and they all are not communicating or talking to each other. So we arranged for Ammond and Sheriff Ward to meet on that road, have a discussion, and Sheriff Ward offered, I'll drive you to the county line. And we're like, that's it? Standing side by side, Sheriff Dave Ward and protest leader Ammon Bundy talked about ending the armed takeover of the wildlife refuge. A Bundy associate wanted to talk about land rights and grievances. I'm not here to talk about all that. I'm here to talk about offering you guys the opportunity to leave the county peacefully, get back to your families. We pose no threat to the community whatsoever at all. It's time to get the schools open, let your community get back to living. We do not pose a threat. And that's and, what I'm asking for. But, but that can be I'm done asking. without us leaving. At the time that I offered them the opportunity to leave and to escort them out of the state, there was there was a lot of different components, uh, things going on behind the scenes there. The, the federal side of the House was more on board with, you know, resolving the situation. So no charges had been filed, filed federally. Rather than charging these people locally and keeping them here, if we could resolve the situation by getting them to leave and go home and let them work it out through the legal system. Yeah, I'm sure there was going to be some consequences, but nowhere near the level of consequences that they face after a 41 day standoff. I want to help you guys get out of here. I'll get you a safe escort See, I'm out. Getting, I'm getting, we're getting ignored again, sir. Sir, I didn't come to argue. I just came to offer not either. peaceful resolution. Okay. So I appreciate it. Once they rejected that offer and said, we're staying here, I knew that they were going to force us to deal with them. Giving in to an armed criminal takeover, but it's just not going to work. There came a point where people had to be taken into custody.
Lavoy and, and everybody, we're going into the next county to talk about the Constitution and how they could take their grazing rights back. They've been free to pass from the refuge and into town. We were getting things prepared and we had a cute family there that had arrived a couple of days earlier, a few days earlier, the Sharp family. They were there to sing and they had decided that they were going to go with them to this meeting and put on one of their concerts because it just touches your heart itself. They're just awesome. I heard about this protest that was happening in Oregon involving the Bundy family and I knew the Bundy family from the 2014 standoff. So I called Ryan and I was like, what's going on up there in Oregon? He told me what they were doing and how, why they were protesting. And my mom and I talked about it and she decided she was going. We were a singing family. And that was a big part of our lives, especially when we went to the Bundy Ranch. Our biggest reason for going there was to sing to everybody. And when we went to Oregon, my mom's purpose for bringing the children there was to sing to the people and sing to the FBI and and um, just try to bring some peace and bring some happiness to a situation that was uh, a little bit scary. Each vehicle would leave for safety reasons, 10 to 15 minute intervals, so they wouldn't be close together. The family had left and the oldest daughter who had just arrived the day before wasn't ready. I was supposed to be leaving with my family and I was not ready to go. so. I stayed behind and I was going to leave with the next group that was leaving at 3.30, which would be the, the Bundys and Lavoie Finnegan. We left in Lavoie's truck. It was about a two hour drive for us. The Jeep behind us was supposed to be coming 10 to 15 minutes behind us. They came directly behind us, and for them to be right on our tail was really not what was supposed to happen. Then the boy up in the front noticed this bunch of vehicles, and there was an angled road there. There was a whole bunch of these SUVs and vehicles lined up. What is that? What's going on? And I turn around and I could see all these vehicles that were coming up. All of a sudden, it was like a wake-up call. We've been set up. So we just saw vehicles coming up behind us. We could hear their sirens and see their lights. Um, and we could see them pull the Jeep over. The boy kept saying, we've got to get to the sheriff. We've got to get to the sheriff. And that's in Grant County. We knew that he would protect us. They started shouting to turn the vehicle off and put your hands out the window. And Lavoy didn't turn the vehicle off, but he put his hands out the window and his head. And he said, are, are you pleased? He said, we're going to the next county to talk to the sheriff. I'm going to meet the sheriff. The sheriff is waiting for us. So you do as you damn well please. But I'm not going anywhere. Here I am, right there. Right there, put a bullet through it. You understand? I'm going to go meet the sheriff. You back down or you kill me now. Go ahead, put the bullet through me. I can see on top of his hat is a red laser. I'm worried that he's gonna they're going to shoot him. All right, send the woman out now. Look for well, I'm going to ask them if they want to go out. I was like, okay, I'm not getting out of the vehicle. I was afraid that I'd be shot if I moved too fast or if anybody did anything. Victoria says, I'm not getting out. Then I'm not getting out either. I'm not turning over. I'm going into Day County. I'm well, going if, into Grant County to see the sheriff. Well, if we duck and you drive, what are they going to do? Try to knock us out? How much further we got to go? We got about 50 miles. Should never have stopped. I'm going to keep going. No, we have to duck. I know. What are they going to do with Ryan? Okay. We need to get Ryan shoot, back. Shoot your tires out. That's fine. Hey, Ryan Hammond? Yeah. Where's, where's Why did they pull you over? There's no service here. Just because. Are you ready? Well, where's those amp? Where's the guns? They got to stop. You can't get around it. I'm going to go. You guys ready? Okay, get, get down. Then you duck now. Give me that camera. Okay, give me this camera. Go.
and I looked out and I could see one vehicle behind us uh, pursuing. Keep going. So what about Alvin and those guys? They can't, we can't get around them. I'm going to go get help. Okay. And then all of a sudden, uh, he said something about a roadblock. Hey, Alvin. Hey, Alvin. Okay, so they're shooting. Hey, Alvin. Okay, we're here. Go ahead, shoot me. Shoot him. Stay down, stay down, stay down, stay down, stay down. Damn it, are they shooting him? Did they shoot him? You asshole. Oh my god! I just hear a bunch of shots all at once and he fell. I started shouting that I was an EMT. I was trying to get up, trying to get out. Is he dead? Bump it out. I'm an EMT! Stop it. Stop it. Are you dead? No, I'm not dead. No, hold on, hold on, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do anything. Go to bed. Where the hell is the boy? I can't see. Shut up. Stay down, Oh, God. Stay down. Stay down. Stay down. Stay down. Oh, shit. They didn't want us to get out, whoever was shooting at us. Then. The next thing we knew, this blue smoke stuff started coming from the front uh, um, seats towards us, and it hit my nose, and I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was choking. I'm taking some. <laughs> Keep going. Oh, shit. Stop! Please! Stop! Yeah. Stop! That's ridiculous. Those are stupid. Okay. I'm going to kill all of us. Okay. Oh, please. moment for me because I thought that we were all going to die. I thought about my family and I thought about the things that mattered in life to me and I just thought we were all going to die. This location. I surrender! I surrender. Okay, I don't know. Okay, let's get out. Okay! That's you, Ryan. I don't know if you can get out. You get out first. Let her in first. Let her out first. You go first. You go first. You go first. I started shouting, we surrender, we surrender. And I finally heard someone shout back, send out the mail first. So Ryan got out and while I was standing there, they said, stay right there, stay with your hands where we can see them. And I could see Lavoy laying in the snow and I could just tell that he was dead. I could see men in camouflage and in black standing between the trees. And it seemed like so many of them they yell at me to come, and I'm getting out of the car with your hands up, of course. They're all dressed in military gear or whatever, these green outfits, when they ha and they're like snipers. They have all these long guns, all these guns. They have all these rifles. Victoria and I were yelling at the men. You guys are all part of murder. You just murdered a man in cold blood. She says, I almost died today. And I said, yeah, Victoria, you're 18 years old. And you're going to remember this moment for the rest of your life. I don't know. A lot of people tell me that that um, I shouldn't have been through that at, at that age. Tuesday morning. I called him to talk to him about what I was going to be doing that day. He said he was really busy, that he had interviews lined up with John. That was the last time I talked to him. I'd gone into Fredonia with my daughter for her game about 1.30, and his parents were there, and his brother was there, and my son was there, and we were all there. All of a sudden, somebody came up to me and said, there's been something that's happened. 
and she was hysterical. And she was screaming and crying that the boy had been killed. And it was just unreal. It was not real. Somebody had gone into the gym and told the officials what was going on and they stopped the game and they brought my family into the hallway and we and told them what was going on and we they gave us privacy for a while until we could get ourselves together enough to go over to the local police station and try to get more information and confirmation and because we were still trying we were still holding out hope that it wasn't Lavoy. and that was a nightmare in itself just going over there and making those phone calls to people who were just heartless on the other end and would just push forward or the hold button or transfer me to another agency or transfer me multiple different times and then just put me on an answering machine without answering and whether or not it was the boy. I thought, how could people be so unkind? But and then I, that town had been through so much with the different groups that had come into their town and the FBI and the sheriff's department escalating fear that they were just probably glad that it was over. To leave the vehicle as quick as he did in Shauna's video just confirms that he was indeed trying to move the threat away from those in the truck. The 18-year-old Victoria Sharp is the same age as our daughter, our youngest daughter, and I know he was worried for Ryan and Shauna as well. Those people were victims. Um, and were being shot at multiple times without ever exhibiting any threat to any of those officers. <clears throat> and I believe that he was murdered. I can't imagine anything that could be bad enough that would be made better by the death of a man like Lavoie Senecum. But then I hear my husband tell me that he's scared to death in prison. And so I don't know everything. He was shot in the back without a gun in his hand. Whether he was reaching for one or not, he never pulled a gun out of his hand. I think they expected to shoot someone that day. I mean, they shot at the vehicle before he got out. They shot at all of us, really. Then he got out and he definitely drew their attention away from us. His whole conviction was to protect us. And I know that he was running away from the vehicle so that he would draw the fire and they wouldn't fire upon us. I don't think that he was murdered. Lavoie reached toward his pocket, uh, if I remember correctly, at least three times. I had an investigation done and an autopsy done myself. I picked up his body. I took it to the medical examiner. So I know that he was shot in the back three times. And I know that those exit wounds came and exited on the left side. And that is where he is reaching each time. But his hands go back up in the air multiple times as he reaches for a shot he goes back up and his hand is empty again. He did not go for a weapon or he would have had the weapon in his hand. It's really hard to separate all the factors that led to a tragic death. At the end of the day, Lavoie Finnegan was the one who had the last best opportunity to prevent violence. Had he complied with the orders of the officers, like everyone else in that vehicle, he would be alive today. Mm -hmm.
And unfortunately, there was life lost through the course of this. But I still believe that they found the most peaceful resolution they could. I had asked these folks to go home. It's been said many times uh, you could have taken them into custody here or here or here. There were a lot of opportunities, yes, but no safe opportunities to take somebody into custody after statements had been made that they weren't willing to be taken into custody. If there was a failure somewhere in trying to resolve this, it would be that loss of life. When you look at it, it's tough. You're watching, in my opinion, the assassination of an American. I walk that site. Having military background, I know what an L ambush is. They had put their vehicles in a blocking position, and they had set up along one side of it, the high ground. They had actually cut the tree branches so they're about four to six inches to use as rifle rests. If you went 150 feet past that corner, there was a three-quarter mile straightaway. It had sloping sides and was snow-covered. You could have spike-stripped it, let him drive down, his tires would have flattened, and he had no place to go. I understand there are criminals, but an American that wants to take care of his family, has Christian values, has strong integrity and morals, is shot with his hands up because the FBI team lead amped up his people that he was an enemy? Something's seriously fucking wrong in this country. After Mr. Finnegan lost his life, we were able to get a blockade. What that is is just one more armed element you have to go through. Usually, as in most military operations, when the leadership's gone, the rest of the thing falls apart. Proved to be true. Over the next, what, 24, 48 hours, everybody scattered uh, to the wind with the exception of the four that were left at the end. And I never did understand what their point was. David Fry, Jeff Banta, and Sean and Sandy Anderson are the last four remaining at the refuge, 40 days after armed protesters took it over. The FBI, local and state police cleared out after a standoff. The Malheur National Wildlife Refuge came to an end. About 9.40 this morning, three occupiers surrendered to police and were taken into custody. A fourth, the final protester, refused to leave. But supporters, including evangelist Franklin Graham and a Nevada lawmaker, convinced him to surrender. And he did, after a simple request. He ate a cookie, asked everyone to say hallelujah. When they said hallelujah, he came out. You know, they say that there was an armed standoff in Harney County. That is a total, total bullshit lie. There were people that were exercising their Second Amendment rights. There were people that were on guard, but none of those people ever pointed their guns at anybody. I miss him. I miss him a great deal. I'm learning to do everything that he used to do. When you are a married couple, you're a team, and you each have your own little areas of responsibility, and you uh, count on each other. Was I angry at the Bundys? Oh, no. I've only caught myself being angry a couple of times, and I've quickly brought that into check. I know that what he did, he believed in. And I see him as a hero, not a martyr. I forgive those who have killed him. I usually get a call every night or every other night, mostly just for him to know that I'm okay. And he tells me that he doesn't feel safe. 
what's left. They've given up their right to appeal. So the only thing left is to ask for the president for executive clemency to actually look at the case and, and see whether he thinks it's fair and whether he thinks what they did deserves five years in prison and asking for mercy. I keep hoping that there's some commutation or clemency or pardon or something that there's somebody out there somewhere that can understand what a travesty our federal government is. These were my brothers, my friends. They're locked up and one of them's dead. If Bundy had had his act together, he wouldn't have allowed the militia anywhere close to him. He'd have done an occupation for a period of time and left. And today the law would be on trial. The regulation, all that stuff would be on trial as opposed to him being on trial. What's happening to these cultures? They're being murdered. Ranchers are worried about coming up. They don't want to become the target of the bureaucrats. Martin Luther King got it right. He did peaceful demonstrations, sit-ins, walked across bridges. Bundy did it with firearms. I want to make something clear here. We will see other standoffs. The overall majority of this movement is peaceful, but there are extremely dangerous threads which, when the time comes, will yield towards confrontation as opposed to reason. Pretty tough to feel American when your own government has a vendetta against you. Yes, I still love this country. And I wish we could fix it. Now you're going to have to buy it. It's a used gun. You get rich by giving the poorest people on the planet the means to continue killing each other. You sell by the kilo. There are men going to our garbage cans. Is there anything I should be worried about? She doesn't know how you pay for all this. How many car sales we talk about there were? There are problems for more people every year than mine. This mine is a safety switch. I would tell you to go to hell, but I think you're already there. Pilot 
Yes, we have iPhones, so we can. I'm just deciding which dark secret to reveal for the first. Fearless is about teaching people to fear less and really making the point that the people they might put on a pedestal, they don't succeed because they don't have fear. They succeed because they've learned how to manage their weaknesses, how to manage their fears, and how to capitalize on maybe one or two key strengths. What the turning point for me with bombing was, I remember one time just being on stage and I was bombing, and I just pictured all my friends watching me, laughing at me in the back, and then that got me a laugh at myself. I wouldn't say I'm fearless. I just try to be funny. I'm not that deep. Do you want to do this? Just <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I sneak. As far as long-form, dense, tactical interviews go, this is about as entertaining as it can get while focusing on making it usable. Don't be afraid to try crazy things. I thoroughly enjoyed the format, and the audience component was a great idea. Be in a position where you have thought of everything, but don't let any of that slow you down. Tim had a lot of penetrating questions, quite a few of which I have never heard before. I think the show in a number of practical ways will help people to overcome their fears by helping them to define their fears. I just vow on that I will never make another note of music that I don't believe in with all my heart. The most successful people you can imagine have many different flaws. Therefore, none of those things are fatal flaws in you yourself. School was just hard for me in general because I just hadn't developed good social skills. There's no magic to it. Part of my goal is really to just go behind the scenes with these people, dig into their brain, and get the specifics. The people that are watching have a deeper sense of how they can pursue what matters most to them. To love deeply, to care, to have a life that has meaning, and maybe pursue the path of mastery. Five, four, three, two, what makes this show different, it's not just the highlight reels, it's a real focus on obstacles, struggles, challenges. So the same lessons you're going to go and learn there, the things that are going to help you in business. People that are going through things, watching this, that are like, way harder than the stuff that I've ever had to go and face. And I hope it helps them in some way. Looking at how all of us as humans, as imperfect creatures, can carve our own paths. So after, you know, a couple hard years and running through millions of dollars and many a lot of it is my own money. We had to go out of business. So we have first roadkill story. <laughs> it was fun to kind of talk about the breadth of my entrepreneurial life and not just focus on the last 10 years of Tom's. You can use key photographs. You can do research and pull up videos that perhaps the guests themselves they haven't seen in 10, 20 years. Tim did a ton of research. I was pretty amazed. There were stories I didn't even know that I ever told anybody. <laughs> Maybe he had one of his hacker friends go into my phone, listen to my conversations. No matter where you are, no matter what your job, no matter what your obligations, there are things that you can borrow from these people. I think of it as a pyramid. First, I have to be able to not smoke pot, not become an alcoholic, manage my money, all the way to the top. This is a refreshing blast of cold water to wake you up and to get you to take action. And that's what I want to share with people who watch the show. Fearless with Tim Ferriss. Premieres Tuesday, May 30th at 8. Only on audience. Your brother was in a lot of trouble. I'll fix this. This is the expression of like who I am. If it's in your blood, it's in your blood. I don't know that you ever saw the fall. Forts, arsenals, dockyards, magazines, and other needful buildings. That's all they can have 
as far as places in the state of Oregon. This whole reserve here is unconstitutional, and the states have to, well, of course, right now the militias are stepping up to take this land back from the federal government and giving it to the states. There is a federal central power called the federal government that says that they own and control one-third of the land mass of this country. Now, they have complete legislative power. A man just sitting behind the desk can write a statute that has the force and effect of law. If I or the rancher gets contrary with that, there is a ranger, a BLM ranger, that is armed with a gun that enforces that statute. If you get contrary more, you're hauled before a federal court. Now, neither the bureaucrat is elected nor accountable to me, and the ranger is not elected nor accountable to us, the people, and the judges aren't. All three branches of power are combined into one without representation. So this is a serious issue to freedom. Everything that we live in, the cars we drive, the clothes we wear, everything comes from the earth. When those resources are restricted or controlled to the point where people can't access them, they can't use them, they can't benefit from them, then what it does is it puts people into poverty. A perfect example of that is Harney County. At one time, Harney County was the wealthiest county in the state, and now it's the poorest county in the state. And it is directly connected with the federal government coming in and controlling its land and resources. Well, these are the best of times to come on down to Hines. In the 20s, Edward Hines Lumber Company had a 50-year contract for cutting timber here. This town was amazingly wealthy. The mill was operating lots of lumber. I was stunned at the escalation of FBI presence. They had turned the county courthouse into a fortress. They had ringed it with chain link cyclone fencing. They had put in Jersey barriers for like ramming. Those guys were kitted up for warfare with more kit that I had seen in Afghanistan. The amount of escalation and force that they were willing to use for a handful of protesters it was very um, shocking. We were 35 miles away from the town. Nobody ever threatened anybody. I don't understand where the level of fear came from. They shut the BLM down. They shut the Forest Service down. They shut the schools down. There wasn't a gun at the refuge that would shoot 30 miles. We in this land, we grow up plinking tin cans with 22s, hunting jackrabbits, and the first thing we're taught is what? Do not point guns at people. And so I have never in my life pointed a gun at a person that I never intend to. You know, they should never point a gun at me, and I shall not point a gun back, and, and we shall leave it at that. But, but I will live under a clear sky till the day I die. Worst case scenario, they come down and kill us all. I don't think they want to do that because they still lose. The American people across from ocean to ocean will retaliate and uh, their power will be taken away from them. We know that what we're doing is right. We know that this is constitutional and we know that we're trying to improve this country. I know what our government can do and I didn't want these people to get hurt. I'm just out here to keep people safe, make sure there's no shots going off. If the FBI did come, they would come dark. With hey, the only reason that we have guns here is for our own personal protection and safety. Right now, the threat level isn't as high or intense, so we don't walk around full kit, uh, you know, slung weapons everywhere. There, there may be a few individuals like that, but one of our number one orders to all the men and women here, never, ever, ever fire unless fired upon. And we will stand our ground with that. We are calling out at this time because of intel that we have received from a solid source that the FBI is indeed planning on uh, moving on us, if you will. I had put out a request for assistance from the Oregon State Sheriff's Association. And since it was a federal wildlife refuge and had been taken, I, I requested that the uh, FBI handled that investigation. 
Christians. We are preparing to defend ourselves, preparing to defend the people of Harney County, and we are preparing to expose this corruption that has been going on for years, and it needs to end here. Thank you. When I grew up, I never got out alive. I never spoke out of turn. You know, I was one of those kids when I, when I walked from in class in Sunday school when I was a little kid, all the other kids were rowdy, and I, I always folded my arms and trying to get, it came naturally to, to be in line. Um, and so this is very out of character for me because I've always tried to follow the rules. And, and to get, do you know I don't have a speeding ticket today? I, I do have one warning. This choice is solely mine. Nobody asked me to do this. Uh, Bundy's didn't ask me to do this. Um, they didn't. They didn't stop me. They respected my choice. But this, this choice, this decision is is mine and mine alone. And I will live with it. And I'll bear the consequences, whatever they may be. Night vision. They've got helicopters, MRAPs, all that fancy technology. They've got unlimited resources, and we're just a bunch of <laughs> we're just a bunch of guys out here with rifles that we bought couple of years ago, there's some guys out here with rifles from World War II. They're ready too. They've only got five shots, but they're ready. I, I have a feeling if the FBI did come here that uh, nobody would be leaving alive. With the escalation of FBI presence, it became very concerning that they were going to try and go after these guys violently. There was a discussion is what do we do? And so the decision was made that PPN would take a neutral position. We would not endorse support or other, but it became Ammon, you guys stay on the refuge, government FBI guys, you stay on your side of the line. Keep the separation here. You two have issues you want to discuss and work out. You, your civil disobedience, drawing attention to land use, they can do that. Keep your distance. We have every constitutional right to be doing what we're doing because it very clearly states in the Constitution that <clears throat> the federal government does not have the right, does not have the authority of the, from the people to come down into the states and to control its land and resources. If they are to, if they are to control land and resources in the state, then it has to be properly ceded to the federal government. And the way that's done is outlined in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. Under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, Congress will have authority with the consent of the legislature over... We were number one in the state for per capita income for at least one year in the 70s. Tonight we look at a battle that's raging in the United States over an endangered bird. The northern spotted owl is said to be on the verge of extinction. Logging in the Pacific Northwest has almost eradicated its habitat. Biologists believe this bird must have the large trees of the ancient forest to survive. There are only 3,000 pairs left, and they say if it goes, it means the entire ecosystem and all who live in it are at risk. The environmental industry got their act together put the focus on the spotted owl and undermine the timber economy within six months. We lost a thousand jobs in this town in a county that had around 8,000 population. It was absolutely devastating. We're in a tower. Uh, these towers are actually used to detect fires from long distances and we use it for observation um, in case the feds decide to roll in here and kill us. It was, it was kind of scary for the first couple of days because uh, we thought that, as we've seen throughout history, Ruby Ridge and Waco, um, Ruby Ridge, I mean, the FBI and ATF came in and they shot a pregnant lady, uh, a pregnant woman who was unarmed. So they've been known to come in and kill people. It originally started off with the Hammonds, but I've been fighting the BLM for years now. I was at the Bundy Ranch standoff. The BLM's original role were land janitors. Now they're armed with SWAT teams and attack helicopters and weapons of war. Uh, why would they need that? If they're just supposed to be land janitors. And it, they, they should not constitutionally exist. The goal of this occupation is one, to get clemency for the Hammonds. We'd like them out of prison. And also we'd like to see the control of these lands go back to their rightful owners and just give back into the hands of uh, the